parliamentarian in the U.S. Senate has ruled against the Democrats allowing the amnesty bills, which are the amnesty for the DACA recipients, the amnesty for TPS, the amnesty for agricultural workers, and the amnesty for essential workers. It's what we've been talking about for the last several weeks from being included in the reconciliation. To go back a little bit, the reconciliation is a budget bill. You are allowed a majority to pass a budget in the U.S. Senate. Everything else, all new laws, require 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. The Democrats have 50 votes, plus Kamala Harris, which makes it 51 votes. They were trying to put the immigration amnesty into their budget bill, the $3.5 trillion bill that they want to pass by my birthday in a week from now, September 27th. I doubt it will get passed by that day. The parliamentarian decides on the Senate rules. And the Democrats went to the parliamentarian several days ago. She is an unelected person. Mm. She is supposed to be nonpartisan, unelected person. She's been the parliamentarian since 1999. She votes and rules on how the Senate procedurally should operate. And she does not, by the way, her ruling is not a final ruling. The Democrats can overrule her and say, you know what, we're going to vote for this anyway. But she gives her legal opinion, and many Democratic senators are not going to want to vote for the immigration bills in the reconciliation if the parliamentarian says it is not a legal maneuver to do so because they believe that the voters will take it out on them for bending and breaking mm. Senate rules and the democratic process. So it's back to the drawing board for the Democrats. Now, what the budget bill allows, it allows you to make a budget. And if there is some ancillary changes in the laws that change the laws, but it is mostly a budget maneuver, then it's allowed. If they are new laws with new things happening, then that's not a budget maneuver. That is a new law. So you have to look at it from both sides. Now, I want you to know something. Me personally, I was kind of fooled in a way in the sense that I thought this was going to pass the parliamentarian. For sure, if it did and the reconciliation bill passed, for sure, every senator was on record of wanting to vote for these amnesty bills. They had the votes in the Senate. They had the votes in the House. Mm -hmm. It was getting past this woman and then obviously passing a full reconciliation bill. Wow. And I was kind of fooled in a way because I thought that this was going to go past the parliamentarian. This was going to be in the reconciliation bill. And my thought process was... I hope the rest of the reconciliation bill comes together mm -hmm. so that way immigration would be able to pass. I did not believe prior to this parliamentarian ruling that the immigration amnesty bills would not be included in the reconciliation. I did not believe that was going to happen. And maybe I was fooled myself where I had wishful thinking, you know, when I look right. back at it. But if you really look, and I want it to pass right. more than anybody, okay? I am extraordinarily disappointed. Yeah. But if you take a step back, whether you're pro-immigration, you don't want the immigration bill to pass, and you say to yourself, are these new laws or is this a budget thing? Mm. These are new laws. Yeah. I mean, the reality is. I mean, they're making four new amnesty laws that didn't exist before. And saying, well, because we're charging money, it's going to raise money for a budget. Therefore, it's a budget maneuver. Well, I mean, you could say that about almost anything at that point. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, almost any law bill would be able to get into the reconciliation. So in a sense, as a Monday morning quarterback, you know what that means? You now decipher the football game from Sunday on Monday mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. oh, you should have done this play. You should have right. passed. You should have ran. You know, you look back and you say, you know what? The fact is that they are new laws. Mm -hmm. So you can't blame the parliament. I'm disappointed completely. Right. If anything, I blame the Democrats. They got to do things. You can't get people's hopes up. That part. You can't get people's hopes up after, what, 30 years of trying to pass an immigration law? 
a generation and a half of people who are working here undocumented mm -hmm. can't, can't make a better life for themselves. A generation and a half of people. My son is in college. My daughter is in college. The last time the immigration laws changed was before they were born. A long time ago. That's a long time It's a ago. long time ago. You can't get people's hopes up. And the discussions and the talk and the finally, thank God. And then basically it's like, take a gun and shoot the person. Shoot every person here. It's the same physical pain as the emotional pain of being let down. Now, Senator Durbin, who was heading all of this, he says he has another trick up his sleeve. Okay. To go back to the parliamentarian. From what I understand it, is they're gonna go back with another plan. What is that plan gonna be? Is it gonna be a pared down amnesty? Or is it gonna be completely different? Now, when you look at what the parliamentarian ruled, she ruled that this is a new law. Mm -hmm. This is not a change in the law. This is a new law that is ultimately changing the dynamics of immigration in America. So if they really want to pass immigration reform, I'll give you two suggestions of what I believe they would come back with. Okay. Because they're going to come back with something. It's not over yet. They're going to come back with something. It's going to be either a pared down version of this amnesty that we've been talking about or something completely different. My belief, if they were smart, is it would be something completely different in the sense that you got to work within the framework of laws that have already passed and say we are going to not make new immigration laws. These are existing immigration laws that we're going to amend in order to raise money as part of a budget. That to me would be a smarter move than coming back with some new version of an amnesty or a new immigration bill. Mm -hmm. Thinking about it, because the parliamentarian said, these are all new laws. It's not a budget thing. You're making new laws here. So let's take the existing laws and see how we can help people by changing it just a little bit and making money from it or changing the budget from it. And I'll give you two things that I think they could possibly do. And they've talked about this in the past. So this is not just something in my crazy brain. These are things they've talked about in the past. Two things that they can do right now by changing two sentences in the Immigration and Nationality Act. You're not even making a new bill. You're not making a new law. You're changing Just a sentence. Changing it. Okay. Okay. One is registry. Right. Registry is an old form of amnesty. Uh, what it says is that if you were in the United States continuously as of January 1st, 1972, to the present, you get a green card, as long as you didn't have a green card previously. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not as if you had a green card, you got ordered deported, mm -hmm. and now you're living here, you'd like to go. It's, you never had a green card ever in your life. Mm -hmm. That's what registry is. Now, that hasn't changed, that date hasn't changed in 35, 40 years. January 1st, 1972. Every person who applies for registry has to pay filing fees to the US government. Okay, right now the filing fee is $1,225. There's nobody applying for registry anymore. You want to know why, Jonathan? Because it's so far back. It's so far back. Everybody, <laughs> everybody who's been here since 72 has right. a green card. Right. Okay, so you want to raise money? You don't want to make a new law? You want to help that. people? Change the date. Change the date, yeah. January 1st, 1972. It's now January 1st, 2020. Right. Every person, whether it's DACA, mm -hmm. I mean, you want to have an amnesty and not make a new law right? and raise money, change the date. January 1st, 2020, it's no longer $1,225 filing fee, it's $2,000, right. whatever it is. People will be thrilled to pay it. Okay? Great way to raise money, you didn't make a new law. Makes sense. This law is on the books. Right. Okay? Just update it. You're just updating it. Another thing they could do, change the 245i date. Mm. Now, we talked about 245i a lot. It's changed several times throughout the iterations of Immigration Nationality Act. 245i is a bill that says if you entered the country without inspection and you get sponsored in a job, you get sponsored by a family member, you invest money in a business, whatever it is, you go through the sponsorship process. 
There are too many people who go through the sponsorship process and can't get their green cards in America because they're undocumented. They're out of status unless you're married to an American citizen. Mm -hmm. They all have to go home. Not everyone can go home because you need a provisional waiver. Most people who are getting sponsored in jobs, you can't do job sponsorships anymore. You bring back 245i, you can do job sponsorships till the cows come home. Everybody pays a penalty fee and adjusts their status in America. That's what 245i is. You've heard me talk about it a lot, about grandfathering in. It changes the dynamics of everything. People get sponsored in jobs. They get sponsored by their family. They don't need provisional waivers. They don't have to go home. They don't have to come back. All you're doing is changing a sentence. Instead of saying you had to start your case by January 14th, 1998, or April 30th, 2001, and been physically present here December 21st, 2000, mm -hmm. you had to start your case by January 1st, 2023. Pick a new date in the future. Yeah. Everyone gets sponsored in a job. They get sponsored by a family member. Boom, they pay a penalty fee. They get their green card here. They don't have to go home. We don't have to worry about provisional waivers. You change one sentence in the law, you've raised lots and lots of money. Mm -hmm. Two things they could do that I believe would most likely pass the parliamentarian because you're not making new laws. Yeah. You're just tweaking a law to raise money. Yeah, you're still making money, right. To make money. You're tweaking a law to make money. You're tweaking existing laws. And by the way, that would help. If you did that, two sentences, 70% of the undocumented immigrants in America between those two. Not everybody, but almost everybody. A majority. It's a very sad day. Yeah. It was a sad night for me last night. I didn't sleep well last night because I was upset about it. Yeah. Now, they say they're gonna come back with something. We know that for immigration to pass, it's gotta get into this reconciliation. There is no way in the world any Republican is voting for immigration reform. Just not happening. Because the Republicans are the party of the status quo. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And you know what status quo is? We want white middle class majority rule. Right. And if you get an immigration reform, the country becomes m even more <laughs> multicultural than it is. Just They don't want that. They don't want that. <laughs> You're not going to get Republicans to vote for that. So it has to go through the reconciliation process. Now, I'm not the parliamentarian. I am not an expert in Senate procedure. I am telling you what I think is possibly could happen. The reconciliation has to be done in the next week, 10, 12, 14 days. So whatever they're coming back with, they'll be coming back this week to the parliamentarian. So stay tuned and we'll see where everything goes from here. I'll let you comment, guys. You said it all, you know, I mean, it, I, this is why I really love this part of the show because you know so many people have been wanting to know what was going to happen and for this to happen where we didn't even see it coming definitely gonna have to stay tuned to find out what they come back with yeah. I'm gonna tell you something as much as I wanted these four amnesties mm -hmm. to pass if they update the registry which you remember you had said that like I, before I, you even I, read but right the, the, I've yeah. been saying this for years yeah they update the registry they help so many people it doesn't matter whether you were DACA, you're an essential worker. They complicated it. It makes the application process so much easier. My All you have to do is prove you were here. You don't have to prove I worked in this job. You know, how many questions did we get? How do you prove you're an essential right. worker? Right. My question is, why do you yep. think they have not, you know, moved that day up? Uh, I think it's about political cover. So in other words, mm. if you move the registry date up, the congressmen who are up for election, mm -hmm. senators who are up for election, who are in the more moderate districts, they can be accused of making an amnesty. Uh -huh. If you say, we didn't do an amnesty, we targeted people who deserve a green card. Right. So they picked people who they said deserve a green card and therefore I have political cover. What are you telling me? Kids who came here when they were little can't get a green card? Right. You're telling me the people who pick our apples should all be illegal? You're telling me the people who are the essential workers in the United States yep. of America mm -hmm. who are helping everybody, right. who helped everybody through COVID while you were sitting home watching TV, they shouldn't be able to become legal? It makes yeah. it much more politically palatable to be able to defend that mm -hmm. vote versus defend a vote of... I just gave an amnesty to everybody. Right. But I think what they have to do is 
give an amnesty yeah. to everybody at this point. The Congressional Budget Office estimated, had the parliamentarian allowed this amnesty to go through, over 10 years it would have added $700 billion to the budget of the United States of America. It would have been a plus $700 billion. That would, if there was a registry, how much taxes would be collected? Mm. Think about the tax money that would be collected. And by the way, for all of those people who don't want an amnesty, nobody's going anywhere. You're right. Okay? I mean, let's, let's, <laughs> let me, let's call it as it is. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's going anywhere. Right. Just because you don't pass this doesn't mean that all of a sudden now everyone's going to pack up and go home. Right. They're here, whether you like it or not. So collect their tax dollars. Right. At least make it make it make it worthwhile for America. Right. Let's be a humane right. place. Collect tax dollars. It's a benefit for everybody. Right. Meanwhile, the other big immigration news: the Haitians at the border. Yesterday, the United States blocked the Mexican border in an isolated Texas town, where thousands of Haitian refugees crossed and set up a camp. They've been crossing from Ciudad Acuna, Mexico into Del Rio, Texas for almost three weeks now. Many of the Haitian migrants were actually living in Latin America for years, but are now seeking asylum in the United States as economic opportunities dried up in Brazil and elsewhere. Earlier Sunday, the United States sent three flights of Haitians back to their homeland. Some said the recent devastating earthquake in Haiti and the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse make them afraid to return to a country. Yeah. I know on TikTok, for example, I've been getting a lot of questions on TikTok. So watch Brad Show Live TikTok. No, but I've been getting a lot of questions on TikTok that, hey, Brad, I'm a professional and an H-1B, and I'm waiting years and years and years for my green card, and now I see Haitians at the border, and they're coming in and going to be granted something. Mm -hmm. And I get other questions on TikTok. Wait a second, that's not fair to the Haitians at the border. Mm -hmm. How come the people from Afghanistan can come in, oh, right. but the people in Haiti all get sent home. Right. My answer, and there's no right answer, by the way. Mm -hmm. Whenever anybody tries to be fair, somebody ends up getting end the short the end of the stick, no matter how fair you try mm -hmm. to be. People who are coming in at the border from Haiti have to pass a credible fear interview. Mm -hmm. You can't just show up and say, I'm Haitian, and be allowed into America. So you have to pass a credible fear interview. You have to go to an immigration judge and prove your asylum case, which is extraordinarily difficult to do. And you have to live and be in that side of the border. It's not a pleasant thing to be. I want to wish it on my worst enemies to be there from the pictures that I've seen. Right. You know, so to say, well, how come that's not fair? They're getting in ahead of us. That's not necessarily true. And then I wouldn't wish anybody to be living like they are trying to come into America. Right. There's gotta be a better way. I don't know what the better way is. Meanwhile, the White House is asking Congress to pass a law providing green cards for tens of thousands of Afghans evacuated from Kabul. Uh, the proposal was included in a funding request the White House sent to Congress on Tuesday asking lawmakers to provide $6.4 billion towards the Afghan refugee resettlement effort. Be interesting to see if the Republicans vote for that. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Happy Hispanic <laughs> Heritage Month. Each year, Americans observe National Hispanic Heritage Month from September 15th to October 15th by celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. The observation started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week, but then it got expanded under Reagan. It covers a 30-day period, and that is significant because it's the anniversary and independence for many Latin American countries, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In addition, Mexico and Chile celebrate their independence on September 16th and September 18th. And according to the U.S. Census, the Hispanic Latin American population of the United States as of July 1st, 2019. Do you know how many, Vanessa or Jonathan? It's up there on the it's screen. Did Julian, did Julian just put it? <laughs> Julian just put it up. So 60 million. 60 million. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> you guys are brilliant. That's unbelievable. They constitute 18.5% of the nation's total population. Almost one in five. Yeah. Yeah. One in five. Nesquik. Being yeah. Hispanic, how do you feel? What does Hispanic Heritage Month mean to you? All I'm 
OMG, where'd you guys find this? Oh, it means so much to me. This was actually my first beauty pageant ever. I was Miss Hispanic New Jersey. You were? Um, around, yes, yes. Yeah, around the time. It really means everything. I was speaking at an event this weekend, and I really took it back to how much being an immigrant is really what roots everything in what I've become and it's it's a big deal to come into this space and have so many people celebrate your culture while mm -hmm. we are still adapting to everything happening here in the states and and accepting the American dream and working through it and there's just so much color around Hispanic Heritage Month. I just love it. It's, it's lovely. It's it is lovely. There's a lot of notable oh, people. There's a lot. AOC, J Lo, Bad Bunny, Sylvia Mendez. She fought her whole life for civil rights. Sonia Sotomayor, Supreme Court Justice. I can go on and on and on and on and on. But this month is just not about the names we know. It's also about the Hispanic people, the yes. Latin Americans who have contributed sure. to our society in big and small ways in the past, the present, and the future. Coronavirus update. <laughs> Uh, 228 million cases worldwide, more than 4.6 million deaths. There have been more deaths in the United States from coronavirus than from the Spanish flu now. Oh, damn. The Spanish flu of 2018. Yeah. That was a pandemic we learned about in our history books. I certainly learned about it when mm -hmm. I was in high school. As part of American history, we have surpassed it. In 1918. We have surpassed... I was not in high school in 1918. No, but that was when the, that was the when, Spanish flu. That was the Spanish flu. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and the Biden administration today announced that they will be allowing tourists to return from Europe. Finally, two years. If you were from the UK or you were in the Schengen zone, if I'm pronouncing that name right, you had to stay out of the European zone. Also, China and Iran and Brazil. You had to stay out of Brazil for 17 days, stay out of China for 17 days, stay out of Europe for 17 days, which is quite a silly rule mm -hmm. because many of these countries had lower transmission rates than many of the countries that people had to go to to sit in in order to come to America. Right. But you had to leave and go 17 days in another country and then, really? co and then be allowed to come visit America. That rule is changing as of the first week of November. If you are in the European zone, if you are in China, Iran, Brazil, you will be able to travel to the United States of America provided you show a COVID vaccination and you also need to uh, take a COVID test and show you are negative within three days of getting on an airplane. <clears throat> So starting in early November, um, our hotels in America, Times Square, we're going to start seeing the tourists back in Miami and New wow. York and L.A. So get ready for more crowded streets. I'm excited for it. Definitely get a little buzz back in the United States of America <laughs> from all our friends all over the world who come to visit. Um, but you do need to show a vaccination. Well, that's good. Um, if you are not vaccinated, they will At not least. allow you in. Uh, and you also have to have a negative COVID test. The reason apparently it took them so the United States so long is they put in a new computer system that the airlines are going to be tracking the names and oh, telephone wow. numbers of every person who comes in. So the United States will have some sort of electronic follow up. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna probably get, as a European tourist or a tourist from anywhere in the world, coming in in November, some sort of text message or email message or something follow up about COVID. Oh, what wow. they're following up, I'm not sure, but they will be following up with you after you come in the US. If you are an American citizen and you are unvaccinated, you need to show a COVID test result that you do not have COVID within 24 hours oh, wow. of okay. getting on the airplane. And then wow. you will need to take another COVID test within a few days of entering the United States of America. So they're We're making it a lot more difficult for Americans who are unvaccinated to travel mm -hmm. into the United States of America. I saw a question about what about children? Um, I don't know because I haven't read the full rule, but I would say that uh, at the moment, um, 
the COVID vaccine by Pfizer was approved on emergency use for children. Uh, I don't believe that it has been fully approved for children yet, but once it becomes fully approved, I would assume that children would also need to be right. vaccinated. Because I read somewhere it said like yeah. five to eleven now, yeah. like children. Yeah, but but 11. it's but it's on emergency use. I don't believe mm -hmm. it's That's been so young though. Yeah. Oh, but they're hoping by Halloween, according to Jillian, in my ear, mm -hmm. that it will be fully approved. Once a vaccine is fully approved for children, children would need mm. to be vaccinated as well to enter the United right. States of America at that point. You know who loves corgis? Who? My Jilly Bean loves corgis. Oh. <laughs> she was showing me all the pictures. Of, she goes, look how cute these corgis are. I love they these corgis. Cute. They look like little foxes. So yeah. there's it. Fans of the corgi, they gathered for the annual corgi races at Emerald Downs in Auburn, Washington in late July. It aired on ESPN on August 21st. That's right. ESPN showed the corgi dog race <laughs> they are athletes two of these dogs they are one user even likened the event to free therapy and true words have <laughs> never at, been spoken there they go wow. the corgi race <laughs> the, i feel so bad for the one that just like ran <laughs> off the track <laughs> you can see one just like look at look at look one is the like last it, one because he just saw somebody eating some food right, like, right. For the food. i would have been like no yes. no go straight go straight <laughs> <laughs> the family-oriented event began in 2017. It was such a hit. Emerald Downs made it an annual competition. Participants are purebred Cardigan Welsh Corgis or Pembroke Welsh Corgis. And while all entries received swag, only the top 12 competed in the championship race. Let's watch the championship race one more time. <laughs> Let's go. Which one? We have it there. They're off the there races. Go. Boy, look at that one Corgi. Corgis one. away. <laughs> <laughs> I know the the one that won the first. And meanwhile, I'm sorry. The, no, the one that won. I know. I saw like the uh, the owner. There's like a whole video of them like super excited. Yeah. Look, look at him. That's look um, at him. That's, yeah, that's Angus. By that's the way, Angus. is the winner. Look how hype he is. Yeah, Angus, I love it. Look at it. Angus, the winner. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's uh, Angus of Auburn. Ultimately, won the championship. It was his second year in a row. Oh. He was oh, a repeat. Come on, Angus. Yeah, Angus. He's like Usain Bolt. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're yeah. going to put Angus and Usain Bolt in a race together next. <laughs> All right. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute of Washington, D.C., the Panda, uh, D.C. Panda Cub, Zhao Kui Ji, just turned one. Oh. Yeah, the base uh, on August 26th, he received a delightful frozen fruitsicle cake oh yes Ooh, the base was made of frozen diluted grape juice and decorated with sweet potato apple parrot pear and banana the <laughs> national zoo panda keeper marty deary told people magazine the cub has been a special gift to the zookeepers and the public who follow him on the panda cam while the zoo was shut down during the pandemic oh. do you like pandas i do would I you do rather like... have a panda that was harmless a harmless panda or really fast corgi, Vanessa. Would you well, have a so you come home every night to a really speedy corgi, or a completely harmless panda? Oh, the panda. I'll take the pandas panda. get really big. <laughs> I would like the like the cub, the panda cub. I would like that, but uh, look how big they get. Yeah, I would take the corgi. Yeah, you want to know what? You want to know? You want to know why, yo yo? Why? You know what they say. Big panda, big poop. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you'd be cleaning up some big poop, oh, right? Yeah, I... If I have a panda, I would hope I have a home with enough room for a panda <laughs> to then hire a with the panda. Why you can't you, you know? can't have a panda a panda out in Miami where you at? No, uh, yeah, where I <laughs> sure, sure, we can put. A I, I think Vanessa would be praying for like a dwarf panda. Can mine right. be like some like dwarf panda, like you know, like, like the dwarf that horse? Dwarf horse. The dwarf horse. horse. Yeah, like, like I mini, would like that. Yeah. Mini panda. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's all meet Miffy the bunny, known on social media as Bunny dot NYC. Uh, at Bunny dot NYC is called a fashion icon Whoa. by his fans, but to his owner Sammy Chen, he's more than just a cute pet. In 2016, Chen adopted Miffy when she lived in Taiwan. She says she decided to adopt Miffy because she was struggling through a tough time 
in her life. I was thinking of giving up my life, but then she adopted um, Miffy the bunny, who brought a lot of joy to her and really got her over her tough times. Um, she says, from the very, very worst situation to the very good situations, he's always with me. And I guess she dresses him up in all different types of outfits, and he has become very famous. Uh, Chen never intended Miffy, by the way. She never intended Miffy to become an Instagram star. You never <laughs> intend to become an Instagram star. It just happens it miraculously, happens. right? Right. Right, Vanessa? Right. And never, yeah. you never, you would never go on a beach and, you know, pose, pose with a cute buddy away the and looking away in the sunset and say, <laughs> I never intended this to happen, but apparently right. it just happened. But when they started taking walks on the street of New York City, Strangers kept stopping the pair to ask if the cute bunny had an Instagram account. And is that being, the bunny at yeah, Fashion Week? Yeah, it is. <laughs> after so many Hi. times, she finally created the account for Miffy. <laughs> Miffy has 104,000 Instagram wow. followers, 578,000 TikTok followers. And she hasn't even answered any immigration questions, and she's got 578,000 TikTok followers. Maybe you should get a little <laughs> matching bunny. <laughs> And she's been in a fashion show three times because the owner's a designer. Oh. That's why she's in the fashion show. Oh. Yes. We have an update on Wally the Walrus. Oh. Okay, we've been following Wally the Walrus. Remember Wally the Walrus? Yep. He, he, he got lost. He ended up in, where'd he end up? In Ireland because he got on a floating ice cube. <laughs> ice, you know, I, you know, ice something or other that broke That's off the... Right. Uh, Iceberg, thank there you very you much. I got tongue tied. <laughs> An iceberg that broke off the, uh, the, I guess from the Antarctica or from you know the North Pole or wherever he was from, and he kind of floated into Ireland and he's been sleeping on people's boats. <laughs> we talked about this a month ago. Yeah. He's become very famous there in Ireland. So he's he's very far away from his native Arctic. So now people have Look chipped in. All the boat owners there in Ireland have chipped in and got in Wally the Walrus a floating couch. <laughs> he now has his own couch to hang out on, <laughs> so he does not have to go sleep on people's boats anymore. You know, he's comfortable. Um, he right, got a nice, right. nice comfy couch. I'm wondering if they actually did that for Wally or for their boats. I think, they did, I think they did both. What yeah. would be great is if they gave Wally a remote control and a TV. Wow. He would be, he would be set. He's on his couch. He's got his remote control. He's got his TV. You never know. They're pretty smart. You yeah. know, they do the clappy <laughs> yeah. stuff, you know? <laughs> well, I'm glad that Wally finally has his own couch there. He's not bothering people on the boats. Right. <laughs> Vanessa, that's our, that's fuzzy. our fuzzy Monday of the day. Thanks for watching. For more Bradshaw Live, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.